So um, thanks again to Andrew and to Gary for being the inspiration of the day and to overlapping networks because the Graham Foundation gave me my very first grant 15 mm. years ago, which allowed me to quit my corporate job. <laughs> and I've never looked back since then and, and uh, Sarah and I go way back as well. Um, so anyway, I, my project um, is, you know, I come, to, again, I come to this uh, field as, as an architect. Um, the work you'll see is about um, criminal justice. I have many um, collaborators, um, and it's not, as, it's not as replicable yet, I wouldn't say, as, as, uh, as Gary's project, but you never, you never know, and there's points of overlap, and there's definite points of departure, and we've been having conversations about this all day. So, but the beginning um, of the project was, was set up as a, as a research project and one year into the project, we applied to the Architectural League um, of New York as a competition architecture and dot, 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 and the project became called Architecture and Justice and that's a name that has kind of stuck. Um, we exhibited the work as a, a series of maps and a table. Over the course of the exhibition, we transformed the space into, into a scenario planning workshop where we brought together um, experts from the field of criminal justice, urban planning, um, homeless services, um, graphic design, information design, uh, NGOs from, pub from education organizations, etc. The work also then was displayed at the, at the Museum of Modern Art um, in a show called Design and Elastic Mind. Um, and we've also done work on the, uh, in, in New Orleans, which I'm going to focus on tonight. But I just want to introduce the major concepts and the way it started. This is a map of Brooklyn, and this is a map of incarcerated people in Brooklyn and the amount of money that's spent on incarcerating them which is in 2003, $350 million. Um, these, this is a series of lines which connect the home addresses of people who are incarcerated um, in the year 2003 to where they are incarcerated, which is upstate New York, to show that the money has moved $350 million from inner cities of Brooklyn, the inner, inner parts of Brooklyn to um, the, the shrinking industrial fading industrial towns, um, upstate New York. This is how much it costs to incarcerate them in 11 blocks of Brooklyn, and we called these million dollar, million dollar blocks. Um, and this is where we ended up moving the project to a very specific um, community in New Orleans where in fact now Ceasefire is, is starting um, one of their, one of their um, projects as well. Um, We've done this across the United States um, in, many, in many different cities. That's uh, Wichita and Phoenix, Arizona. Um, that's my collaborator, Eric Kadora, on this project. And what brings us together are things that don't intersect at all. Um, from, from the criminal justice point of view, it's policy and um, what does it say there? <laughs> the world of, of policy and governance, and on the other side, it's design and, um, and institutional organization. So what, what is it that you can say about a prison that makes it a total community where you live and work and sleep every day? And what is it de that defines a community which is a flexible organization and uh, you know, an, open, an open structure of, of habitation? Um, so in the scenario planning workshop, we gave people a set of cards around the table. Um, this project has gone all the way up to um, Congress, which I can't speak about too well because of the whole, a huge organization of, um, of, act, of activists that have been doing this at the policy level, but it's resulted in this Criminal Justice um, Reinvestment Act, which I'll explain a little more. So in, uh, in New Orleans, what we did was we we used a one data set, which I'm going to elaborate on today. Um, we mapped that data for advocacy and communication at both the state level and the community level. And we really put that work um, into action in a, in a community that, that needed it. Um, we began our work by presenting it, um, by first trying to um, insert it in the, in, in the community and almost, you know, getting booted out in various contexts, <laughs> um, right post-Katrina. 
Um, we eventually um, coordinated with a group of NGOs who then helped us present it to the, to the city council and then from then on it actually was a very intricate um, network which allowed this work to, to take place. Um, so in New Orleans and in many cities um, across the country, prisons are part of infrastructure but because they are in the city, they're not in the city, we forget about them. Prisons and the people they house are part of our urban communities and we, we really should pay attention to that. Um, the, the project was really to try and ask the question, who is incarcerated and where do they come from? We use specific data about individuals and in this case their privacy as opposed to, um, to crime mapping projects is really protected and we set that data uh, in, geographic concept, in geographic context. The key um, concepts that we're trying to elaborate in New Orleans and beyond is million dollar blocks and justice reinvestment. Okay, so we started with a 2003 set of data because post-Katrina it was hard to come up with any other data. We start with a list like this, which is um, people as they are sent to prison by the court system and they, this data is used to track them through the prison, through, the, through, through their time in prison. And what we do is we forget about most of the data on the one side and only pay attention to their home address. So as soon as you have a home address, you can place something on a map and put it in a geographic context, then you can average it to things like census blocks. The, um, that the, the, spot, the red um, parts of the map show the, the concentrations of incarcerated people. So the data in geographic context shows that people in prison are highly concentrated in specific neighborhoods <coughs> and that those geographies intersect very strongly with poverty and race. So this is a, a map of um, people of color in New Orleans. This is a map of people living below the poverty level. And this is a map of uh, people admitted to prison in the year 2003. Um, so what we look for are inconsistencies. So for instance, in Planning District 2, the, the uh, houses 10% of the population and 15% of the prison population. In some parts of the country that statistic is way out of whack, like in two community districts in Harlem you have something like 20% of the population and 60% of the prison population. Things like that really do show up. Um, so overall, even though it's much less money in New Orleans, it's not the point of the amount of money, it's the, the concentration of where people are incarcerated is, is disproportionate. And that's, those are the places that, we, that the project focuses on. All right, so the work focused in Central City because it showed up over and over again um, as, a, as a part of the city that has a high concentration of incarceration. 4% um, of the population, 8% of the prison uh, population, $4 million. We call that um, a million dollar neighborhood. So the point is that the money is spent on the neighborhood but not in the neighborhood. Um, and on a financial scale, um, this means that the pre predominant governing institution, the way we spend our public dollars, is on, uh, is on prisons and that money is outside of the city. And these people come home. Um, most of the people who are incarcerated um, are sent to prison for a three-year period, which means a lot of this that I'm talking about is nonviolent crime. Um, nationally, 650,000 people return home. And what we're trying to do is to, um, to establish strategies to interrupt that cycle of what we've started to call migration back and forth from prison to outside areas. So using maps as tools, the researchers focus on defining spatial patterns that link poverty, racial segregation, and incarceration, and how their repeated coincidence take on identifiable urban, urban forms. That's where the project really began. Um, this is the neighborhood that we're talking about right near the Super Bowl. Um, Post-Katrina, spatial patterns of inhabitation, crime, and incarceration, and prisoner reentry have shifted. Um, so crime geographies lead to crime prevention tactics, while prison geographies, we're asking, should lead to justice reinvestment strategies. So if you look just closely, look at these hotspots, this is um, uh, showing the patterns of incarceration and how they shift. This is 2003, 
uh, okay, 2005, which we all know there was no crime, no incarceration. 2006, it starts coming back, but it shifts to the higher ground, which is why um, crime got, you know, these problems got so emphasized in the press um, post, post Katrina. So again, in 2006, Central City showed up as the highest incarceration neighborhood. And by 2007, the amount of money spent on prison uh, on incarceration in New Orleans went almost back up to its 2003 levels. Again, the costs are concentrated in very few neighborhoods. In 2007, although Central City uh, population was estimated at only 69% of its pre-Katrina level, public spending on incarceration had reached 82% again. 3.5 million for that neighborhood. Okay. What we did was um, ask the city that, that so much money was being spent on rebuilding, but very little had been spent on rethinking um, uh, incarceration. And we wanted to really think about how we could change the look of the city by changing these patterns. Um, so while other public and social infrastructure like education, health, and housing were being radically transformed, we all know all the schools were closed, hospitals were closed, um, uh, the city planning process neglected to take into account the obstacles that mass incarceration was causing for um, rebuilding the city. We did endless analyses of the plan. This is the neighborhood that we're talking about. It used to be a center of black entrepreneurship. It was uh, divided by a highway and uh, is incredibly disinvested um, to this day. Um, even so, there were an incredible amount of not-for-profits, criminal justice-oriented um, organizations really trying to make um, social networks and rebuild the city in a different way, which linked together health, um, education, uh, criminal justice, economic development, um, all these silos which are usually kept very separate. And what we did was we, we, we tried to map um, those as positive assets in the neighborhood and really try to think about how they could be more strongly connected rather than kept apart by all the funding streams that uh, keep, them, keep them separated. So we did an incredible um, intensive mapping exercise which linked this kind of data about incarceration to more positive um, aspects of strengthening and building community networks. So very simple ideas which actually don't uh, turn out to cost very much money but support um, what was, this was O.C. Haley Boulevard which was the center of this neighborhood. Um, uh, try to reinforce its existing innovative development pattern, expand its capacity and break the, the cycle of incarceration and re-entry to prison. These are some of the organizations that we worked with, JJPL, Youth Empowerment Project, um, and a couple of pilot projects emerged out of this work. Um, Cafe Reconcile, I rec recommend you all go there. The Ashe Cult Cultural Center um, as well. So importantly, 25% of people admitted to prison in 2003 were 16 to 24. Um, there was one uh, high school that was considered uh, effective or that should not have been closed. So although many of these places and institutions and services were geographically separated, and they really were separated, they had almost never talked to each other, we tried to link them together um, in these networks. We used Facebook, we used all kinds of things. We had meetings, more importantly, we had a lot of meetings, and tried to link together health organizations, civic organizations, um, education, uh, housing, uh, work development, um, we tried to encourage um, uh, uh, business organizations to hire people coming out of um, prison, which, was, which is uh, in some, most cases not done. Okay. Um, this is one of the great pilot projects which came out of it, which is a health clinic in a bus, um, which was located right next to one of the most active churches. In the, in the neighborhood, and that's how people felt safe coming there and telling people their, um, you know, w what kinds of health problems they had. And you know, this was one of the prime example, and perhaps I should end here, um, where 
um, this two-lane health on the road would not have come to Central City because it wasn't a, a part of the city. It just wasn't, it wasn't visible to a lot of um, urban planners and, and things like that. So they were going in Gentilly and the Lower Ninth Ward and all the places which were high in media attention. And the maps and the meetings really encouraged them to bring the bus to this specific site. Um, and, and initiated a whole lot of other projects around it. And so what we did was try to use existing funding and existing projects, but to reinforce those projects by saying, you're all um, dealing with the same population and we should combine some of these efforts together. So rather than keep all these silos separate, we, we really try to link them. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah.